Koranin Fahangi, thank you very much for meeting us for this Open Democracy interview at the World Forum for Democracy 2016. Thank you. This is on education and democracy. And I think that you have been talking a great deal about Jean-Jacques Rousseau in the past couple of days and his theories. You know, in the country where I come from, we launched into a counter-revolutionary reading of Jean-Jacques Rousseau, which said that he was not at all good at bringing up his own children. And I know that your ac accent is on action and not theory. How important do you think it is to support these Enlightenment values and theories today? How important is Rousseau for your Sudbury Valley project? I think the theory is great, but it's uh, but Jean-Jacques Rousseau is from another uh, time in history where uh, women were treated the way they were treated, and I think uh, they would have a lot to learn from the reality we're living in today. Um, even his educational theory is not as, um, you know, I would say it doesn't go as far as what we're doing with uh, democratic schools today. And there was a whole deal of manipulation of the Emile in his book uh, to get him where he expected him to get to, whereas we don't have expectations and we just provide an environment of democracy and care uh, for the students and they can do whatever they want with it. We don't expect them to get somewhere, which is a big change between Rousseau and, and us. Okay, so um, how do you think this system is perceived in the conservative French society? Well, sir. Surprisingly, pretty well. I mean, uh, the growth in, uh, in France, we went from two schools last year to 15 democratic schools this year. Okay. So there's uh, some kind of explosion going on there. And yeah, it's um, drawing up a lot of interest and maybe it does come from quite a bit of frustration from uh, some parents with the current conventional system that uh, didn't really transform much through the past few decades, whereas in other European countries, I think there's been a bit more effort to, uh, I don't know, improve the pedagogy, improve the well-being of the students in, in the classroom, um, the relationship between the teachers and the students. For example, well, Finland is the uh, best example of that, but I feel that in other countries, like in Germany also, for example, in the UK, I think there's been more progress on that, and that we're still quite traditional in the system. We have very vertical, uh, just transmission of the curriculum, transmission of explanations and, and theories, and not much relationship building and doing stuff together. Can I just ask about the French education minister's speech? Because she started off by painting the picture of uh, democracies being able to be mortal nowadays, that we've discovered this, and this post plan scenario in which the challenges on education as well are, are huge. Do you feel that, um, I mean, first of all, you asked her a very interesting question, which I hope you'll repeat. And, um, but tell me what, what you think you would bring to that scenario. Right, so the question I asked uh, the, the Minister of Education is about my school that gives full power to the people in the school and on a one person, one vote basis which gives as much power to a 10-year-old as to me. And uh, we have as much opportunity to exercise this power in our weekly school meetings and make decisions together. Uh, and on decisions that usually a director or a principal takes, like budget and hiring and uh, you know what we do in the school, what kind of resources we have and all, uh, and all that kind of things. And uh, her answer is that, yes, well, you're right. I mean, this is really the... Uh, ultimate place to get to and uh, for now what she has started in state schools is to have a bit more democracy with some student uh, meetings who decide on the meals and decide on uh, parties and associate association kind of things well I think it's really insufficient clearly I mean when you don't involve the students in real responsibilities that have to do with transforming their own environment um, and it's just about projects and, and modifying some tiny things in their environment I don't think they really uh, acquire the wisdom of what it is to exercise power and th they're not in that dynamic of learning uh, how to do it. Uh, and they can't just learn through theory, they actually have to practice power, in my view, to, to be able to gain such wisdom. And then concerning the Paris attacks, uh, I think we, I mean, it calls ever more for the need to transform the design of our schools. I mean, uh, the, the attacks that we have today um, 
they were uh, committed, I mean, they were done by people who felt uh, excluded, who felt isolated in society, who were finding for some kind of meaning in life, and they found it through uh, uh, extremist, uh, radical extremist uh, things that they saw probably on the internet, and they made connections with these terrorist groups and everything, and they grew as terrorists in that. And if we don't offer these people any other hope, and we don't give them care and love, and we don't give them an importance in a, in a collective um, um, setting in which they have a voice and they have some power, I think, yeah, we will not get out of this situation where uh, uh, children feel unimportant and they, and they suffer uh, in, a, in a system that is quite violent on many of them, I think. So, um, how do you, would you describe the social inclusion in this type of cases? Since, like, um, maybe there are people that cannot afford going to dynamic schools. What are the, your propositions in these terms? Yeah, I would... Uh, what I would really see as the best scenario is that private schools don't exist anymore. Uh, my school is private, so it's a bit weird for me to say this, but I don't believe in private schools. I believe that all schools should be... Uh, should have yeah sh sh should be state funded and period and we and the criterion to start a school should just be that well there are some parents who um, uh, trust the the school that you're opening any citizen should be able to open a school and as long as the children are being respected in that school and that the school respects the values of the republic and the values of uh, democracy and human rights then any school should be able to open whatever the approach is and we should just trust the parents uh, for making choices about in what kind of school they want to send their kids in. I mean, this is Article 26C of the uh, Universal Decl Declaration. The parents have the priority to choose what's best for their kids. I'm uh, soon to be a parent. I want to choose what's best for my kids and I want to have free access to a school which I believe is best for my kids and that's Article 26B. This school should be free and uh, yeah, so there shouldn't be any school that uh, for which I would have to pay uh, myself from my own pocket it should be state funded and do you think that you do diversity differently because there's this challenge of racial discrimination and hate speech and all these things that the French education minister was saying that followed on from these attacks in your school there is an emphasis isn't there on the uniqueness of the mm. different children so first of all, what I'm quite proud of is that in my school there's quite a lot of diversity, a uh, mix uh, of uh, ethnic backgrounds and also a mix of geographies because there, there's people coming from all uh, around Paris and not just from the uh, 14th arrondissement which is quite, uh, you know, uh, a neighborhood in which it's quite expensive to rent a place or to, to live in. So the, so the mixed uh, population, uh, I mean, I think there's quite a lot of mixed population in my school which is great. Uh, because it favors, well, you know, uh, diversity and, uh, and respect for diversity. And not only that, but also uh, the fact that in our uh, rule book, uh, every rule is quite... Um, when someone breaks a rule in our schools, there's always something that's done. There's always a consequence. And the consequence is decided by the students and the, and the staff together. And uh, there are sanctions that are, that are given. Whereas um, in a usual school, what happens in the, um, in the yard uh, well, except if there's an adult kind of supervising and watching what's happening, nothing is going to happen. Whereas in my school, everyone is responsible for the atmosphere of the school. And when you see something, you say something, and then there's a consequence. So, for example, if there's hate speech, which is not uh, appropriate and which is against the rules, it's brought up to our judicial committee the next day, and we deal with it. And if it's something really seriously unacceptable, then the, uh, the student will probably get suspended for a couple of days, and that's, and that's how it goes. So it really brings up the standards to a very uh, high level in terms of uh, examining your own behavior and seeing what's appropriate and what's not, what's respectful of human rights and what's not. Um, well, I have a question concerning the diploma, since we, the friend, well, we are in a society that diploma is very important. Um, at the end of, the, of their scholarity, are they need to pass the back, or like they're gonna be forced to pass by the public system in order to get to the faculties and to pass um, with what we call le concours to get into the grand école? <laughs> are they are they need need to get in that link and it, or that if your diploma is um, qualified to get in directly into the faculty? 
So that's, of course, a very usual question we get from the parents because this is the first worry they have. Is my child going to get a diploma? Well, first of all, I can't give a yes or no answer to that question. I mean, the child is six. How am I going to know that in this 12 years time, even, even whether the baccalaureate is still going to exist in 12 years? So, you know, but let's say, OK, it exists and the child uh, needs it to pursue on to what he wants to do with his life. Well, then the child is treated just as any responsible human being and he or she does whatever is necessary to get this. But this is one goal among others that could be. I mean, it, what if you want to become a farmer and farming is going to, I'm sure, become more and more popular with uh, you know, new things that are going on in this, uh, in this area and the knowledge that is in the baccalaureate is just completely useless for becoming a good farmer. So um, to, to this question, I, I would say we don't have any expectation from the students that they uh, have absolutely to prepare for this baccalaureate and even from age six they have to get in this stream of year by year studying until they're ready for this uh, especially because we have many examples of students not doing any academic work or not even opening a textbook until age 16 and still being able to start at that moment to uh, prepare for this exam and take it and uh, and yeah and and get this uh, diploma i have an example from my school an american student who came to my school in paris because you know their parents needed to be in paris and his goal was to go back to the us and he had to deal with it with his parents his parents uh, uh, told him if you take the geds and you get uh, grades that are good enough to go to university then we let you do whatever you want with with your life so he was so motivated with that goal of finally being free uh, from his parents that uh, one year in advance, he took the GEDs. He wasn't a great student uh, at all before, but he got a straight A's on his GEDs just because he had the time to do it his own way, the way we would do it as responsible adults. Just grab the book, review whatever is necessary to review for the exam and play the game and hack the thing and then get your visa to, to, for the free life that you want. And he went back to the US and didn't even go to university and he's founding a little uh, community with his friends or something and uh, so he's free. <laughs> you talk a lot about parental choice but you must be actually giving young people the chance to do what they want to do rather than what their parents want them to do. Mm -hmm. Do you find yourself caught up in this dynamic a great deal? Well uh, the thing is that these parents agree with the deal that uh, during the time in which they're at school they uh, this is the school space and they do whatever they want all day long whatever they want in the world and th this is our deal so if they don't like that kind of approach they they, they, exactly they don't so, so it is really what they want also it's really what the parents want and they're and and it's really a cooperative uh, process with the parents uh, and there's a lot of discussions going on with them to understand better and better how this how this works um, so then the thing is that they don't get involved in what's going on in school, but we don't get involved neither in what's going on in the family. But usually, I mean, the families who make the, such a strong choice, they also have quite a, a culture of, uh, you know, respecting their children's choices at home as well. I mean, if you want a democratic school, you're not going to replicate uh, like a traditional autocracy at home. This would be quite incoherent and schizophrenic. And, um, well, I was reading an article a few minutes ago that talked about the fact that there are students that are not quite motivated in doing, well, things, they just like stay there and kind of do not do anything in the, in, the, in the day, as it was described in the article. Do you think that this is because they haven't found their path or what is it because, what is the cause of this um, unmotivation? I mean, I think there's, it's impossible to say that someone is doing nothing and even hanging out and uh, having conversations is doing something. And conversations are very present in our school and, and they're actually what uh, the students do most of the time uh, because it's actually a really effective learning tool. I mean, it's the best thing we, uh, we have as, you know, as human beings to, to be able to evolve, to understand each other, to... Uh, and to learn things. Uh, so we don't, I don't think the problem is with students not having enough of a meaning and enough projects. It's more the point of view of the adults and their concepts about what an education should look like that makes us judge that a person hanging out is just hanging out and he should start being led by 
an adult who tells him what to do because what he's doing with his day is not productive enough and things like this. I mean, this is all inventions and all habits that we have from our own schooling, which are very hard to challenge because, you know, we've been doing this for ages now. Uh, but yeah, we don't, we don't judge students who are hanging out and who are playing around. It's, uh, it's, it's their choice and it's actually a fine thing for their development. It helps them uh, know the world, it helps them become more emotionally stable. Uh, it's uh, f for their personal development. It's, it's, good, it's good stuff, really. It, it is good education to let the children play and chat freely. It's uh, what we've been doing for, uh, you know, for uh, hundreds of thousands of years and it's quite effective. Can I just ask you, because in the, in the lab I just went to, they were talking about digital education. And they were pointing out that Twitter, for example, is really bad at conversation. It's fine at telling people something you want them to know, but it's not very good at inviting responses and exchange. And I was just thinking about what you were saying about how important conversation is. Mm -hmm. And I often think on open democracy that this is what we really need. We need conversation spaces, we need debate spaces, mm -hmm. and digital doesn't help us very much in that direction. Mm -hmm. Have you made any discoveries of things that are useful for you? First, I completely agree with you. Uh, to I think a big part of, uh, of having a successful life is building relationships of trust and uh, links that are of really high quality with people. And there's actually a Harvard study, a 75-year study on, on happiness that was done on uh, populations from two very different backgrounds. I mean, people from disadvantaged backgrounds and people, I think, Harvard graduates or something. And uh, the, after 75 year of years of research, the clearest thing that they found out is that happiness is clearly linked with the relationships, uh, the quality of the relationships you have with people. And I don't think that you build relationships on the internet. You can just exchange uh, information, but all the body language, all the communication that has to do, um, uh, you know, uh, face -face. with face to face and even uh, body to body, even hu hugging someone is something, of course, we all know uh, creates. Um, uh, a high level of trust between people, shaking a hand, I mean, all these things don't, uh, are not possible on the internet, right? So I think the internet is great and it's um, opening our minds and our intellectual um, research on a great diversity of things and personally it helped me build my ideas a lot about education. But I think it's not enough and, and in democratic schools we work with people, we are together, we're uh, we, we live together, uh, we make decisions together, and we see each other face to face in circles where each person has a voice and raises his hand to talk to the whole um, uh, meetings that we have. And I think this is extremely effective in terms of uh, self-development. Uh, and I wouldn't trade it for just a purely online course kind of thing where, where each person is just behind his screen. I think this is actually a pretty horrible scene to think of. <laughs> so, um, we have been talking a lot here in France about the phenomenon of Celine Alvarez. Mm -hmm. She's trying to implement um, this alternative while she hasn't well succeed. What do you think this has happened um, in the public media has mediatized it as it was something really bad? <laughs> I think it's a great story. Uh, I know Celine personally um, and what she's doing is uh, fantastic. Really? Can you tell us what it is, because I'm... So, uh, Celine, actually for three years, she implemented the Montessori-style pedagogy in a, um, in a kindergarten, mm -hmm. uh, which was in a neighborhood that's uh, quite a violent neighborhood. I mean, it's... Uh, in France, we categorize the neighborhoods. I don't think this is great, but, they, but it's called ZEP Eclair Plan Violence, which, is, which means Educational Priority Zone uh, Violence Plan. So it's... Oh. So imagine, right, a neighborhood that's, you know, not doing so well in yeah. terms of violence and all. And um, she obtained stellar results with the children. You know, they knew how to read and count and write by the age of five with all Montessori pedagogy and was very effective. So this is something I'm not too fond of because I think children should just start to learn how to read whenever they want. And even if they read at age nine or 10, that's completely fine to me. Uh, but what she managed to show is that with a great deal of attention and care uh, given to the children and a lot of presence and letting them be free to uh, choose what they want to do uh, between the different workshops that she built for them and to have cooperation naturally built, being built between the different uh, 
children, mixing ages also from three to six. So all of these things are things that you find in democratic schools, uh, ex especially the age mixing, which is extremely effective in terms of you know everyone growing up uh, effectively. Um, well, she showed that her method was clearly effective, and then her project was shut down uh, by the you know by the ministry saying like okay the experiment is over thank you very much you know the information is good uh, but you know there's n there's not going to be any follow up so which was extremely frustrating for her so what she did she thought of doing is that uh, just as a um, uh, she she wrote a book and just as a consultant basically she is going to spread this pedagogy as much as she can all over France with just teachers who want to do it. I mean, you don't need more than this, right? You just need people who are motivated to do that thing in their own classroom, and then you're good. And she managed to propagate this thing over thousands and thousands of classrooms just by doing, um, uh, well, uh, training programs and by uh, just sharing open source everything she knows on videos and on everything. She, she did a huge amount of work, and yeah, I think we need people like her to challenge and to boost new initiative inside the system uh, as well. That leads me perfectly to my final question, which is Jakob Heck's call for 20%, uh, what was it called, democratic, uh, I can't remember exactly how he put it, but elective, elective space mm -hmm. in schools. Mm -hmm. Is this good? Is this the right percentage to ask for? And do you think it's working in this conference? I think the idea is actually spreading quite well in this conference and Yakov got a pretty good raise of hands going for 20% or even more. So of course democratic schools work with 100% but this is so radical that for most parents and adults and teachers and everyone acting in the education world this looks like completely unachievable and utop utopian. utopian. Uh, even though it's not utopian because we're doing it and it's real and it's working and it's been working for a century but okay people are maybe everyone is not maybe not ready for this but for 20% I think people are ready I think this is a really realistic uh, goal that for 20% of the time so maybe let's say one day a week children and uh, well students and teachers sit together in circles and they uh, it, with a democratic process decide on what they are going to do with this time together just like Google does with their employees during 20% of their time, they're free to work on whatever projects they want. So especially if you have this democratic time of co-design of what the teachers and students are going to do together, I think it could really boost the building of relationships of sincerity between the teachers and the students and feel comfortable together and being in a, in a thing where we build together collectively. It's not just listening to the teacher and taking exams. It's actually we're doing something together. And, um, you know, it, it is quite revolutionary, but if we have just part of the time that's dedicated to this and that we dare to at least experiment on that part of the time and, yeah, maybe do a bit less of curriculum, uh, just, you know, uh, exam taking and curriculum learning by heart, uh, you know, I think, I mean, I think it's common sense. Let's just do it, right? I mean, <laughs> the time is right for 20%. I think the time is definitely right for 20% and the world is ready for this. Thank you very Thank much. You. I mean,